Hey everybody, how are you going? Good to be up here at Highfields. Amazing church full of amazing people. Um, so this morning I, I'm just finishing and I want to put an anchor in the end of the series, Out of the Cave. And it's not about the series Out of the Cave, it's this is an anchor to hold us out of the cave. And I want to ask you the question, what makes you jump out of bed in the morning? Other than a cramp, if you're my age. <laughs> what actually makes you jump out of bed in the morning? What is it that actually gives you the life for the day that you've got ahead? And I think it's such an important thing to catch and, and understand what it is that actually makes us jump out of bed, makes us excited about life. And I want to go back to King, 1 Kings. And in 1 Kings, we've just spent a lot of time in this particular passage. But 1 Kings 19 verse 10 says this, Elijah replied, I have zealously served the Lord God Almighty, but the people of Israel have broken their covenant with you, torn down your altars, killed every one of your prophets, and I'm the only one left. And now they're trying to kill me too. Isn't that interesting? Here he is, this guy who's just stood on a mountain, called down fire. God's consumed an altar. He's just killed lots of these prophets of Baal and the other ones. He's run faster than a chariot. And all of a sudden, he's got to this place after such an incredible success. He's got to this place in life and he's going, I, I, I. I. Oh, and I. How often do we get there, but When the thing's going on in our life or we've had a little bit of success and then we, we're living out of that success for a while, it becomes an I. All about me. And then one of the things I noticed about Elijah there is he said, yeah, it's, it's all about everyone else's fault. The, the, I'm the only one left. The people of Israel, they've broken the covenant. The rest of them, they're no good. It's all about me. Incredible, isn't it? I find that sometimes I get there. And I find sometimes other people get there. That the focus shifts around the I and the blame of others. You see, he lost vision. Here's a man who lost his vision. Here's a man who had an incredible call of God. Now, when I think about this, Elijah didn't just end up going, oh, well, lost his vision. God went, got rid of him. Actually, God sent a chariot from heaven and picked him up. It's not a bad way to get to heaven, isn't it? <laughs> Most of us, we end up in a coffin and we get to heaven that way. But actually, God sent a chariot and picked him up. So God wasn't necessarily cranky with him. But he's saying, he actually is saying to Elijah here, and if you read 1 Kings 19.9, it says, Elijah, God's saying, Elijah, what are you doing here? And he responds, not addressing God, he says it this way, he goes, I have zealously served the Lord God Almighty. He's talking to the Lord God Almighty. Wouldn't you say something like, God, I've served you. But he didn't. He, he actually took it to a, a third person approach until he started to blame other people. And I think we get to those places where we start to lose vision. We start to lose who God and how God has created us and for what purpose he's created us to. You see, when the challenges of life come, it's so easy to think we're the only ones. Ja, this is just me. But the funny thing is, you know what I found? Most of us are like the rest of us. We all face challenges. Challenges come and challenges go. I, was, I met a lady the other night, one of our staff members at Woolworths, and I was walking through and we talk, she was talking to you about some challenges and, and you know, oh, all the things that are happening. We've got lot, we always have lots of things happening, but there's a few challenges right now with building and different things we're doing. And uh, she said, oh, how do you handle that? I said, every, in every challenge, there's an opportunity. It's just how you perceive the challenge. As a leader, challenges or problems are our fodder. Otherwise, we don't need leaders. Why would we need it if everything was perfect? If you're a leader in a business, the challenges aren't a problem to you. They're, they're an opportunity. How do we see them and how do we deal with them? Otherwise, we can get like Elijah and pull back and go, ah, oh, well, I'm the only one left. Oh, it's all their fault. It's the staff's fault. It's this person's fault. It's the economy's fault. It's the government's fault. It's the prime minister's fault. Instead of saying, hold on a tick, God, what do you want me to do? Where's the opportunity that I have in this? 
Proverbs chapter 29 verse 18 puts it this way about vision. Where there's no vision, and I love this out of the Amplified, no redemptive revelation of God. No redemptive revelation of God. Where there's no vision, where where you can't see where God's taking you. The people perish. But he who keeps the law of God, which includes of man, blessed, happy, fortunate and enviable is he. You see, without vision, without prophetic vision, without knowing where God's taking you, you can end up in a spot where you go, oh no, what am I doing here? Just like Elijah did here, he ended up in this cave going, I just want to die, what am I doing here? He didn't have the unfolding revelation of God and we can suffer the same thing. Another version says people cast off restraint. People actually, when there's no vision, they cast off restraint. And you see people ending up in trouble in life, in relationships, in work. And they cast off restraint. They don't have the unfolding vision of God in their life. I like the way it's written. And there's a book, a great business book called Good to Great. I don't know if you've read it. If you're a business person in this place, you've probably heard of it. But I love the way the author puts it. He said, Mediocracy has robbed many of the zeal to live an extraordinary life. Wow. Mediocrity stole from people. Mediocrity steals from me. Ah, oh, well, she'll be right. We can put the Aussie way on, can't we? Hands in the back pockets. She'll be right. No problems. Close enough. Good enough. Hey, mate. But steal something from us. Steal something of the power and presence of God in our life that wants us to go on, wants us to achieve, wants us make, to make incredible difference in the world we live in. See, one of, one of the things that limit us is the idea that good is acceptable. Ah, close enough's good enough. The good's acceptable. You see, I I look at what we have in in this church. We've got a good church. We have. This is a good church, you know, and I'm totally biased, and I am, and I'm happy that I am. But it's a good church. I look at it, we've got good people. And, And I look at it and go, wow, imagine what God can do. But you see, if we stop at just a good church... When we're called to be a great church, we're called to be a life-giving church, we're called to be a church that reaches this area for Jesus, we're called to be a church that empowers people, equips people, encourages people. We want to be a great church, we want to continue to be a great church, we literally want to go from good to great and we can't let mediocrity stop us from doing that. We can't just let close enough be good enough to stop us. See, great churches is like the needless quest to chase that luxury. You say, oh, well, it's, why do we need to do that? Why do we need lights or screens? Murray, it would have been all right, mate. You know, we could have just gone through today without screens. It would have been okay. But we actually want to create something that's an irresistible place for people. And you think about that and you think about your, I think about my life. I look at my life and go, God, what in me is is resistible to you and what in me is resistible to others? What am I doing that's pushing people away from knowing you? And gee, that can be a challenging question. What is it that I'm doing that when people look at me, they go, if that's Jesus, I'm not interested. And it's a challenge. That's why we want to build an irresistible church. We want to remove the resistibility out of it. Ah, well, that's not very godly. Well, I actually think it is. I think Jesus was pretty, pretty irresistible. I think he still is incredibly irresistible when you encounter him, when you know him. I look at what he did when he was on earth and he created irresistible environments. 
He created such good environments that he was able to feed 5,000 and all these different people and created environments where people got healed and people walked out of graves. He actually walked into one environment and he actually had to clear the environment out of people because of their unbelief because he wanted to create an irresistible environment to raise somebody from the dead. What is it in us that we're actually allowing to come into our life that can be, make us resistible? I think about my mum, and some of you will know the story of my mum and dad, but dad wasn't a Christian, and he spent a long time, about 30 years, mum prayed for him. And one of the things she found, if the constant badgering to come to church didn't work, it just didn't work. Uh, why, why don't you come to church? Not interested in church. You spend too much time there anyway, darling. You know, you're on the flower committee. You're on the, this. You're on that. You're cleaning the church. You're doing this and doing that. I'm not interested. For 30 years, she prayed for him. One day, when she got home all disillusioned because no one would go to church with her where there was a visiting speaker, he said, well, what about me? You haven't asked me. And that day, he walked into church. Gave his life to Jesus. Whole world changed. For him and for everybody else. But what is it that we're doing that can push people away from Christ? See, Mike, Mark Batterson puts it this way about vision. And I like what he says. He says, quit living life that, as if the purpose of life is to arrive safely at death. Quit living life as if the purpose of life is to arrive safely at death. What an incredible thought. But how often do we live our life where it become a safety mechanism that we just go through the journey of life and we arrive safely at death? Wouldn't it be much better to slide into there with vision? Say, hey, at least I had a go. <laughs> Made a difference in the world. So let me talk a little bit about Highlands vision. Our vision is, is simple. We're about leading people into a growing relationship with Jesus. That's our vision statement. If you know what, what we're talking about, it's, it's about the Great Commission and the Great Commandment. We're leading people into a growing relationship. With Jesus. Not just about putting your hand up and saying yes to Jesus. There will be an opportunity today if you don't know Jesus to actually invite him into your life and say yes. But it doesn't stop there. That's why we have Discover courses. That's why we have the things we do. That's why we get involved and we serve and we make a difference in the world. We actually grab hold of the call of God for our life and that's what we want to do as a church, to lead people into that growing relationship. To live out the great commandment and the great commission. If you know the great commandment is to love God with all of your heart, all of your mind and all of your soul and love your neighbour as you love yourself. So it's about loving people. It actually sums up when you actually go back to that scripture we quoted before about loving God. In Proverbs 29, 18, it, said, it says this, it says, and my iPad's just jumped on me. Why don't you love that? I say people don't use iPads when you're preaching. <laughs> um, here it is. Look at that. Jumps up. Um, who keeps the law. And what's going to happen to them is they're going to be blessed, happy, fortunate, and enviable. And to keep the law of God's easy to love him with all of your heart, all of your mind. And all of your soul, in other words, completely love him. And love your neighbour as yourself. If you understand the laws of God, if you, if you actually look at the laws of God, there's 49 commands of Christ and the laws of God. If you have, actually have a look at the, the um, Lord's Prayer, you'll see that it's broken into the same model of loving God and loving others. If you look at the Ten Commandments, you'll see it's about loving God and loving others. And... That's what we want to do. We actually want to live out that. 49 commands of Christ, or 52, depends on what theologian you read. But they're broken into two areas. To love God, to love others. And that's our vision. That's our vision as Highlands, is we want to be a, a people known for that. We try and say it this way to give people a better context of it, that you know God, not just know about him. That you actually know him. It's a relationship. We know him. We walk with him. To find freedom. We all want freedom. Freedom is found in community. Isn't it interesting that we actually find freedom not by ourselves, but we find freedom with others? That's where freedom's found. When people, we, we get next to people and they rub off the sharp edges. Anyone found that? Anyone married here? 
rubs off the sharp edges, sharpens us up sometimes, but actually rubs off a few edges. To discover our purpose. You know, you're fearfully and wonderfully made. You're here right now, in this place, for a purpose. You're not a mistake. There's so many people who wonder why they're here, but you're actually fearfully and wonderfully made. You're created to be in this place at this time to make a difference in the world. To be marked as people who actually make a difference. It's our heart as Highlands is that people actually find those things, to know God, to find freedom, discover their purpose and to make a difference. We frame it up this way to try and give further clarity in it is the statement, you matter. You actually matter. You matter to God and you matter to us. You matter to the world. You matter to the church. People think, oh, you matter. That's just a lovey-dovey statement. Oh, you matter, Steve. You matter. You do. But you matter so much to God that he died on the cross that you actually have growth. He didn't just leave you to go, oh, well, there's a baby. No, he said, I'm going to actually get you to grow. You know, how, many, how excited do you get when you see a little kid and there they are and they're trying to walk and they get up and they take their first step. You come on, take another step and you see them walk. God's the same with us. Don't we get excited as parents or grandparents as we see our kids take those steps? God's the same. He's excited about us. To grow you matter is a growth statement. That we grow in the things of God. You see, all these purpose, all these statements we have are about growth. There's another statement we have, and it says this if we're not the best, how do we become the best? If we are the best, how do we get better? I had a person contact me on Facebook around that statement. A lovely lady, she sent me a message and said, That's an egotistical, egotistical statement. And I had to explain to her, it wasn't about the best, it was the important, it's the becoming. It's the becoming that's important. It's the bit of change that goes on. It's how we actually change and grow into the image of God. We become better. We don't want it to stay the same. I've been doing some study about ageing because I'm getting old. I'm saying, God, what is it? They're ageing. And I started to study ageing and started to have a look at things about that. You know what? The people that live the longest are the people that have a vision. The people that actually spend time to grow. The people that actually spend time to study and infect their mind. That actually our growth in our mind actually gives longevity to life. Because God wants us to grow and continue to grow. Elijah, he suffered a problem. He thought his days were done. And he stopped. And he went to a cave. And wanted to die. And God said, hold my tick, Elijah. I've got more for you to do. You should go and find Elisha. And I think that's so important, particularly for us as a church, for, to actually understand that it's not just about us, it's about others. It's the finding the Elishas around us. I actually think Elijah could have done a lot more. I think he should have found a lot more Elishas. I think we should, if you, if you listen to Billy Graham, and if you like Billy Graham, I got saved under Bill, Billy Graham in 1968. That's a long time ago. But if you ask Billy, and people have asked Billy, what's your regret? He said, I didn't raise up 12 others. I did it myself. I thought, wow. Wow. Imagine if we just did it all ourselves when there's so much opportunity out there for others. See, that's our heart as a church. Our heart as a church is discipleship. It's our heartbeat. Discipleship. You know, we were Christian Outreach Centre. That's what we were. And, and if you look at our constitution, we still are. We're Christian Outreach Centre, trading as International Network of Churches, trading as Highlands Church, Highfields. But it's not just about the outreach, it's about the walking alongside. It's about the discipleship. And what does that mean? Because it's a lovely Christian word, discipleship. But actually discipleship just means be a good friend. Isn't that interesting? 
Can anyone here be a good friend? We all can. And somehow in our Christian world, we've made it so difficult to do the Christian life and God just wants it to be easy. Even Jesus made it easy. You know what Jesus did? He walked alongside people and said, hey, follow me. He walked into the, to the pub and said, hey, I'm here. He said, saw Zacchaeus up a tree and said, Zacchaeus, dinner at your place. Because he was just being a good friend. Walking alongside people, pointing him towards Jesus, the greatest thing that ever happened in my life, other than my wife. No, even more than that was my encounter with God. And if I truly value that, if that encounter is something that's real, surely I want my friends to know. Not in a religious way, not in a way that's, ah, oh, well, come on, give your life to Jesus, Murray. Look, this book says, let me grab this big black Bible. Come on, Murray. Come on, you can give your life to Jesus. I grew up in that. I grew up in that preaching of standing on chairs and, come on, give your life to Jesus, friend. It's the best thing you'll ever do. And it is. It's truth. But what I've found is that type of thing can push people away. It can become resistible. But actually when I walk alongside people and, and sit down next to them and say, hey, hey, Kaz, how you going? So good to see you. How's life? You know what I've found? People are interested in that. Because they're interested that we're interested in how their life's going. To walk alongside people and point them towards Jesus. See, discipleship, community and worship. That's why our small groups are so important. People say, oh, well, small groups, we just have another Bible study. It's not about that. Yes, we can study the Bible. That's great. But more important is people find a place where they connect and belong and they're known they're loved. They're helped. They're walked alongside where people will celebrate with the good and mourn with the poor. That's what we do of community. And we come to worship. What we do today is we come to a worship service. See, I grew up in, go to church, go to small group and repeat to church on a Wednesday night. And then evangelise. And my personality, I could do that. I could evangelise. Doesn't worry me. I don't get embarrassed. And I could argue with people. I'm actually pretty good at arguing. But one of the things I've found is an argument never wins someone to Jesus. Oh, the apologetics. Yeah, it's good to know it. But I found the argument doesn't win people to Christ. I think the genuine love and concern for people are. If you can catch who we are as a church and a vision of the church, we walk alongside people and point them towards Jesus. Jesus does his job. Bring him into community. I know in our church overall, if you're under 40, you come through the side door, not the front door. You come through via community where someone's invited you to lunch or dinner or someone's willing to walk alongside you and you go to a small group and out of that small group you see a whole pile of people that are loving life and come to church and get involved in the worship of God. You know what I've also found about that? It takes away the question the church should. The church should be. I hear that. I used to hear it a lot more than I hear it now. The church should can. The church should be out feeding the poor. The church should be, you know, they should be out petitioning people. They should be out doing that. Now, with the church, we come together. We're the church. So if you're passionate about that, grab a small group together and do it. If you're passionate about feeding hungry people, I think it's fantastic. Grab a small group of people that are passionate about that and be the church. If you're passionate about politics, fantastic. Grab a small group around you and do that. If you're passionate about being, you know, extending and, and writing to government and doing those things, do that. Grab a small group do it. Because you're the church. That's the power of the church. Many people wouldn't know this, but I was one of the people that started what was known as ACC in those days, Australian Christian Coalition in Australia. And now it's Australian Christian Lobby. And when we started that with John Gagliardi and a group of people, 
It was a grassroots organisation. It wasn't some organisation centred in Canberra around doing something. It was actually grassroots. It was people in the church being the church. And that becomes powerful. It wasn't about a political party. It was about lobbying. About placing a Christian position forward. Incredibly powerful. We actually had an issue in one, day, in one situation in Brisbane where the state government were doing something. I can't remember the issue now. It was a, a significant issue that was taking Queensland down an unrighteous path. And the Australian Christian Coalition with people from all churches started to fax in those days. And we would fax Parliament House. And the actual people contacted us and said, OK, we've got the message. Would you please stop faxing because no one else can get through? <laughs> but it wasn't one voice. It was many voices. And that's the church activated. That's our heart as a church. But the question I have for you today is, how do you see yourself? What is your vision? What is your vision that takes you on? What is your vision that causes you to jump out of the bed every morning and engage in the day? Do you have something that is actually written down that you can grab hold of and take you forward? Habakkuk 2, 2 says this, Write the vision down and make it plain on tablets, that he may run who reads it. That he is you. That your vision's there so strong that you jump out of the bed and you run with the vision that you have. It goes on to say, for, for the vision is yet for an appointed time. In other words, it doesn't just complete now, it continues to go on. But in the end, it will speak, it will not lie. Though it tarries, wait for it, for it will surely come to pass. It will not tarry. That vision that actually holds us out of the cave. The vision that we can, you know, we've got all these things that got us out of the cave. But the vision of life is actually what holds us out of the cave and keeps us going forward. See, how many times have you seen a farmer, a business person, just a person who's retired lose their way? I know many people and they, they you know, I see them come off the farm and they end up on the Gold Coast and then they die. And I go, ah, oh, why? Because they've lost purpose and vision. But I see it in business people. I see it in people whose their whole life is to retire. The whole life I'm working because I'm going to retire. That's my vision. And they get to retirement. Then they go, well, what do I do now? And their wife says, go to the shed. I'm sick of you having you around. <laughs> like, let's be real. It's important that we actually have a vision that takes us forward and holds us out of these caves, gives us life. I'll finish this morning. There's a question I'd love you to ask yourself. This question helps me every day. But the question is, what would a great person do? When you walk into a circumstance, when you walk into a situation at work, to ask yourself, what would a great person do? If you're a leader in this place and you've got some decisions to make, what would a great leader do? I shared this last week with Michael Bray and he said to me on Thursday night, we were having a board meeting, he said, Ken, I've used that statement all week. And I've walked into situations, I've just stopped and taken a breath and thought, what would a great leader do? What would a great husband do? What would a great wife do? What would a great student do? Because see, mediocrity, mediocrity will never take us to the great things of God or the great things of life. And this question, what would a great leader do, can help you. You think about that, you've got a vision. You can write your vision down keep it in front of you and then you have a set of values that actually give you your boundaries you stay on the boundaries on what are your values what are your values maybe your values is education maybe your values you value helping people you value different things people have a whole pile of different values you value church you value worship you value serving 
See, those things are our guide rails and our guardrails to how we do life. Culture gives you the boundaries of how we do life. So you have this question, what would a great person do? And the second question, to answer how we actually frame out and flesh out the rest of our life to give us our boundaries, is what is valuable to me? What's valuable to me? Because we have a whole pile of fluff and bubble that go on in our life. There's so many voices and noises and things going on that can distract us from the vision and our values. And if we haven't got a strong set of values and we lose way to our vision, we cast off restraint and we end up in a place where God's got to say to us, just like he said to Elijah, what are you doing here? So if you remember these two questions, what would a great person do? What is valuable to me? Let me pray for you today. Father, I thank you for everyone in this room that they've come to this place to worship you and encounter you. Father, I pray that what we do as a church, that we become a great church, marked at Highfields as a church that actually genuinely loves you and genuinely loves people. We make a difference in the lives of families and children. Make a difference in the lives of people of all ages. Father, we can be known for people that actually represent you well that we won't be people that actually become resistible. Where people go, oh, I don't want to be like that. But Father, we can become more like you who are irresistible. Help us, Father. Help us with the vision you have for us and the values you've placed around our life. Hey, just while every eye's closed and every head's bowed this morning, We do this in every service at Highlands and why we do it is because you matter. You matter to God and you matter to us. But I'd be remiss if I didn't ask you, do you know Jesus? Maybe you know all about him. Maybe you've been in church all your life. You've grown up in a Christian school and you know all about God. But do you know him? Have you got that growing relationship with him that's fresh in you every day? I want to give you that opportunity this morning. The way we do that here is just while no one's looking around, while every eye's closed, every head's bowed, we do that because it's a decision you're going to make, not a decision next to a person next to you, not your spouse, not your friend, but your decision. And the way I do that is just while no one's looking around, if that's you, would you raise your hand so I can see it, so I can pray with you? I'm not going to embarrass you. I'm not going to point you out but I'd love to pray with you and introduce you to Jesus. Right across this room right now, if that's you, and you've never given your life to Jesus, or you're coming back to him today because you've been away and you know you've been away, but today, the day you're coming, I'm coming back. I'm coming home. Don't want to die with this, but it's so important. Last time I'm asking this morning. Oh, Father, I pray for everyone here, Lord. Bless them. If they know you, Lord, continue to pour out your love and purpose on their life. If they don't know you, Lord, I ask you to continue to woo them till they come to that relationship with you. In Jesus' name, amen.